Today I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the Middle Kingdom ride. And I've been working and living in China since 2002 and I, I came originally as a photographer and I, I started working for a lot of newspapers and magazines. Um, but, you know, you can only tell so much with a picture. A picture does tell a thousand words, but actually video tells a thousand pictures. So I felt like I could show a little bit more um, by trying to make video. And, and what I really wanted to show was I really wanted to show China and its diversity. And from China, from the eastern China to western China, the country is very different. And from northern China to southern China, the, the country is very different. It looks different. The people are different. The religions are different. The customs are different. The food is different. And, um, and I wanted to show that, and I had this grand idea of making a television show to show that. So what I did is I enlisted my brother, who is in the black jacket on the left, and uh, he was a China novice. He hadn't been to China before. Uh, he'd been once for my wedding. Uh, but, but he didn't really know China. And then I was kind of the expert. And together, we kind of bumbled our way around China for 60 days, covering about 14,000 miles on motorcycles. We made a television show. And we wrote a book. And the television show will come out later this year in the United States. Um, it's already playing in some places around the world. And the idea was is to show China, to take a kind of snapshot of where China is today. Um, and the best way to do that is to make a road trip. Because when you fly from one city to another, you go to the hotel, you miss a lot. But the places in between usually hold the key to all the really interesting stories. And that's what we tried to capture in our television show. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this journey, this 60-day journey where we completely circumnavigated China. We went up to the north, we went all the way out to the west, we came down through Tibet and back to Shanghai, which is where my home is. And we set a Guinness World Record for the journey. It ended up being the longest motorcycle journey within a single country that anyone had ever been dumb enough to attempt. So we, we, have, we have a lot to show you. So I'm going to start first with a video. It's about a four minute clip that highlights different parts of our television series. And then I'll go through a presentation and show you a lot of pictures. And then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. My brother and I are starting this unbelievable journey. 20,000 kilometers, 60 days. Let's get out of Shanghai, baby! It's really not easy riding a motorcycle around China. Watch out for this yellow bus. We're always tight. It's the perfect storm. No way we're getting through here. This must be one of the most beautiful places you could take a motorcycle. Here we go, he's flying! 100 kilometers of feeling really high, and the next 100 kilometers are just feeling really low. Oh. Hold on. This is a 30 kilometer traffic jam. No one has ever ridden around China on a motorbike before. Oh, water bubble. <laughs> this is more than just an epic road trip. This is the adventure of a life. We are riding through a sandstorm. This is the Middle Kingdom ride. I've been living here in China for 10 years. My brother's been in Canada. Uh, he's been working in the finance industry very hard and he just needed a break. I had my own business in the city, in the big city Toronto, and the lifestyle was just killing me. I, I was an entrepreneur and I sold my business and I just had to get out. It's not what I wanted. Did you work in a cubicle? Like a, the a box type thing where your whole life is like walled in? People were boxed in emotionally. You can't attempt an epic journey like we did without, you know, knowing that there's going to be a lot of risks and that it's going to be challenging. Totally lost the bike from underneath there. But I just felt like we grew every day. Every day on the trip we got a little more wiser and uh, became a little bit more respectful about these types of challenges that we set for ourselves. I've never felt so helpless in my life before. All good. All good. Over here? It's opened my eyes to how people live life in China. And it's opened my eyes to, you know, intense poverty and sort of intense happiness as well. Touch a deli. <laughs> it's not just a motorcycle trip, it's not a two brothers trip. It's 
getting out there and experiencing life and experiencing nature and really enjoying the journey, not just the destination. And I think that's really important in all walks of life. This yeah, that's great. This we, is our, our Guinness World Record. I know. Not bad, huh? Colin and I were debating. Yep. And we thought, what would be harder than China? What what country is more chaotic, has almost as many people, and maybe has even more dangerous roads? And potentially worse toilets. So we are going to try to circumnavigate India next. The roads are potentially worse than China. Worse, yeah, we'll have to be extra. Safe. Worse infrastructure and more cows. If you hit a cow, you'll be lynched. They're sacred, yeah. you know. I know. Sacred cows are really quick, though. They get out of the way. They move quick. Did you hear that? I didn't hear that. Apparently. Don't just say crap because the camera's on. <laughs> well, I don't read guidebooks. You're the update boy. I'm the update boy. So yes, we're doing it. <laughs> and um... <laughs> So that's a little bit of an introduction of the kind of footage you'll see when, uh, when our television show does come out. And you can see just from the video that I showed you, the diversity. You know, in, in one place we were, you know, in the, ju the jungles of southern Yunnan. Uh, in another place we were on the high plateau. We spent 22 days struggling through Tibet with altitude sickness. Um, so, and we really wanted to show that diversity and that's what we've tried to do. So, as we go through, uh, my brother Colin and I, we both grew up in Toronto. And he, uh, he graduated from his university program in finance. And he got into the finance industry and started up a currency trading company. So he was your typical evil banker. Um, and, uh, and then his company was sold, uh, and then he decided that this was going to be his opportunity to take a gap year, because he didn't do that. He went straight from university uh, into work, and he wanted to go out and see the world. And of course, he had an older brother, who that's me, uh, who had been living in China for a decade doing quite fun things. And he said, hey, I'm going to come to China. I want to do something with you. Let's go hiking or something. And then we both said, hey, we both like motorcycles. Let's go motorcycle riding. Um, so he sold his house and quit his job. So he really gave into the idea of that this was going to be a life-changing opportunity. And he was really the driving force behind making this trip happen. And, um, and we did an off-road training course in Germany because we used BMW motorcycles because actually the journey is very challenging. Um, on a motorcycle, you have to really know how to ride a motorcycle to do some of the trips that we did uh, through some of the places we did. So we did do some training. Um, and then after we finished our trip, he actually reunited with his wife and, and then kind of traveled around and now he lives in London, England. So that's Colin. And that's another shot of him in Inner Mongolia on one of the kind of best days we had of riding in the middle of nowhere. And um, before I made a venture into television, I spent my life trying to actually be invisible. Uh, I spent, you know, 10 years being a photographer. And I, I prided myself on being a documentary photographer. I didn't want to interact with my subjects. I wanted to kind of document them in a, in a neutral way where I wasn't kind of interfering with their life in any way, shape, or form. I, I wanted to have true images. And, and that was great. Um, and I graduated University of Toronto in 2001 and moved to China in 2002 and began working as a photographer. And then in 2004, 2005, I got into the New York Times and all this kind of stuff. But in 2008, of course, we had the financial crisis. Lehman's Brothers collapsed, September 2008, and the publishing industry was devastated. And I found myself with a lot of time on my hands. And I said, hey, I want to show China in a different way. I've done the photography thing. Let's, let's, let's try making a video. Let's try making a television show. Let's think outside the box a little bit. Let's go in a new direction. Uh, in 2009, I was named one of the 30 emerging photographers in the world. And then in 2011, we were awarded uh, the Guinness World Record for our MK ride. And the picture you see here is actually all about the financial crisis. I spent uh, a lot of time in Dongguan for Newsweek in September in 2008 because, as we all know, the bank failed and um, there was a credit crunch and the banks stopped lending to each other. And then the banks also stopped lending to their clients. And a lot of factories in China were using this lending to keep their business operations going. And when that money dried up, Overnight, there were about 30 million people who were unemployed. And that was the kind of story I was working on. And the woman here in the picture uh, had just lost her job at a company called Smart Union, which makes small mechanical components for toys. 
It's a Taiwanese company. So, you know, this was the kind of harder documentary photography that I was very much involved in before I took this motorcycle trip. Now, how do you make a motorcycle trip? And how do you make a television show out of it? You need a lot of pictures. And we hired this man. His name's Chad. He's also a Canadian. We'd like to roll together. And um, he was in charge of all of our cameras and, and collecting our footage. And we used a lot of these small cameras for all those pictures of us riding, looking back at our face, and then having another camera looking out to, to see the road that we were we were working on. So it was a real film production that we tried to do here. And of course our motorcycles, uh, we, we chose to use a BMW F800 GS. For those of you who know motorcycles, it's a great off-road motorcycle. And of course having the right bike is important. It's just like having the right camera. Um, it's an important tool and it safely got us around the country. So what was our route? Uh, you can see Shanghai there. That's my home. And that's where we started. And we went up north to Dongbei, all the way to the border of China and North Korea. And then from there, we went all the way to the border of China and Pakistan in Xinjiang province. And then from there, we dropped down into southwest Tibet on a road that's almost never been traveled by any tourists or foreigners, which is called the G219 Highway. And that was uh, this stretch right here, which was incredibly challenging. It was about 1,000 miles of nothingness, and it was all up above 6, uh, 16,000 feet. So it was about four days of not sleeping and getting really ill because of the altitude. Uh, and then we came around through Tibet into Yunnan, down to Guangdong, into Shenzhen, and then all the way back up to Shanghai, 60 days. All the while stopping and filming, all the while visiting certain locations that we felt gave, a, gave an interesting kind of diversity, uh, you know, showing off the features of China's diversity. So that's the two of us. And you can see that we didn't have any beards. We were pretty cleanly shaven at that stage. So it was early in the trip. And one of the things that we wanted to do is that because we were making a television show, it had to be visual. And one of the ways that we wanted to show how the trip was affecting us was we only had one rule on the trip. Two rules. The first one was don't die because the roads of China are very dangerous. The second rule was no shaving. So for 60 days, 65 days on the road in China, we didn't shave. And that way, as we got further along in our journey, as we lost weight and became kind of tired, we also became incredibly hairy. Uh, and it was kind of a funny way of whose beard was longer. And at the end of you know, a busy day of riding in the dust in Tibet, you know, your, your face was just disgusting. So it was good fun. It was a good kind of guy thing to do. Because where in, the, where in the world do you get 60 days where you can just let it all hang out? You know, we're always dressing and shaving and looking nice for our work. So this is a picture of Colin. And he's, uh, he's just next to a big car ferry. And actually, we traveled from Shandong province to Liaoning province. And we crossed this body of water here called the Bohai Bay. And that was great fun. Uh, but the only problem was it was a car ferry and not a motorcycle ferry. So they really didn't know how to deal with our request to take the car ferry. And here they are trying to figure out what the hell to do with our motorcycles. This is a common thing in China, you know. They have a, obviously the boat goes across the water and obviously the boat can hold our motorcycles. But they didn't have a category for motorcycles because people don't usually ride motorcycles in between provinces or even in between cities. They're usually kind of intercity vehicles for commuters. So the idea that two white guys wanted to try to travel around China by motorcycle was already a foreign concept. And the fact that we wanted to put our motorcycles on this huge uh, car ferry posed even more problems. And we actually missed the first car ferry and had to wait two hours for the second one. And they eventually charged us the same fee as the car because they didn't have a category for the motorcycle. And you find this a lot in China where they just can't seem to figure out how to place you. It was quite fun. We we went up right to the border of China and North Korea. And we wanted to do that because that's probably the furthest east that you can get in China. And you'll see here that that is actually North Korea. And we're in a city called Dandong. And Dandong is in Liaoning province. And we stayed at a, at a hotel. And the hotel had a, uh, had a little kind of coffee shop in the very, very top. And it had these binoculars. And of course, everyone's like, you have to go up to the coffee shop so you can look into North Korea. But how many people get to look into North Korea? It was really quite a, a unique thing. And, and at night, it's completely black. 
There's no lights twinkling at all. Whereas the China side is, of course, full of lights and full of new buildings and full of cars honking. But the North Korean side is silent and black. But it was quite a contrast. And Colin and I had good fun. Uh, this is the Yalu River here, which actually forms the border between China and North Korea. And Colin and I, we were trying to hit golf balls into North Korea because he has a great slice. Uh, so he was trying to hit them up and over. And we put a few in the water, but we didn't actually get them onto the other side. But you have to have some fun too, right? <coughs> so um, the MK ride, why did we do it? Well, you know, Colin and I, we met. We did the trip in, in uh, August and September and October in 2010. And uh, I went to New York in March 2010. And I was feeling really distraught. I, was, I, met, I went to meet some of my photography clients and a lot of my you know, a lot of my customers, a lot of the magazines and the publishing companies were actually going bankrupt. And a lot of the editors that I've been working with for many years um, were getting fired. And there were cutbacks and things like this. And I, and I was sitting in Central Park in March and Colin came down to visit me because he was located in Toronto. And we were sitting in Central Park and I was feeling really low. I was just like, wow, you know, this industry that I've been in for the last seven, eight years uh, and really enjoying has all kind of stopped. And, you know, all these people that I used to do a lot of work with, um, you know, it's no longer there anymore. And I was really a bit worried and I wanted to do something really different. And then Colin said, hey, you know, I want to do something really different too. I don't really like the finance industry. I want to try something new. And then he's like, you know, I think I can sell my house and, and sell my car and, and I think I should come to China. And I was like, okay, slow down. Let's not do anything too rash. But he's like, no, you know, this is, this is it. I really want to have an adventure and I think we should do it together. So it was a really life-changing moment. And another thing, too, is my brother and I are quite close, but we've lived apart for 10 years. I lived in Shanghai, he lived in Toronto. So this was also a chance for us to reconnect. He was no longer the idiot 17-year-old. He was now a man. He was in his late 20s. So it was a chance for us to kind of be friends as adults instead of just as children like we were when we both lived in Toronto. Um, so we set May the 1st as our kind of D-Day. Are we going to do this? Now, of course, when two brothers decide to do something, it doesn't mean anything. First, we have to ask our wives. And of course, when you have a conversation with your wife saying that you're going to go away for 60 days because you want to ride an expensive motorcycle around China, you're not going to get a positive answer. So it took a while to kind of massage out what we wanted to get from our wives. And it was a real challenge. Uh, Colin's wife was obviously a little bit against it. And my wife was obviously a little bit against it. But we managed to get it uh, sorted out. And then in July, we did our off-road training in Germany. China is a huge country. They have some of the most beautiful expressways in the world. Four lanes, six lanes, toll roads, brand new. They also have 5,000 kilometer stretches of dirt road. So we didn't know how to ride a motorcycle on dirt. We didn't know how to ride an off-road motorcycle through a river. We didn't know how to do any of that. So we spent only three days actually at this training center in Germany uh, learning how to do that. And we, we did, and it probably saved our lives in, in many ways. And then we actually departed on August the 15th in 40 degree heat uh, Celsius. What's that in Fahrenheit? Maybe like 110? Hot, really hot, nasty hot. So it was a real challenge. So day one actually, to this day, Colin still says that day one was the hardest day of the trip because you have your motorcycle jacket on, you've got your pants on, you've got your boots on, you've got your helmet on, and it's roasting and you're being literally cooked inside your equipment. And of course the obvious thing is you're sitting there at a stoplight and you're in full dress sweating your guts out and then some guy pulls up to you in flip-flops and shorts and a t-shirt and you're like how come we're not dressed like that because you know you do fall we had a really tough time with mother nature on our journey you know for those of you who who know china is huge third largest country in the world i think it's about seven thousand kilometers from east to west maybe four thousand miles from east to west um, and we went through a lot of different climatic zones. We, inter we, were inter you know, we, we had to deal with a lot of different weather. And, uh, and we got rained on for the first 10 days of our trip. So riding a motorcycle in the rain is horrible. I don't know how much it rains in Los Angeles. I don't think too, too much. But in China, it really rains. And on the east coast of China, it does rain. End of August is a little bit of the monsoon season. But we left here because we knew that the Tibet stretch that we had to do had to be done in September. Because if, if you go into Tibet in October, you'll freeze. Uh, and some of the passes will be covered in by snow by then. So we left at a bad time in, for eastern China, but it made sense when we got out to western China. But we did encounter a lot of rain, 
And when it rains a lot in China, you get landslides. And now because there's so many roads and so much road traffic and road construction, um, we got blocked. So this was a kind of, this happened several times. This was a typical example. The mountain just fell onto the road and it left the, the mud up to about our knees. And, we, and there was, you know, a mile back of cars just sitting there waiting for some bulldozer to pull up. But the great thing is, is that China's really investing in their infrastructure. So no matter where you are in China, you're never more than 10 miles away from a bulldozer. So if someone can always go back and hire some guy, pay him a, a couple hundred RMB and make sure he gets his bulldozer up and to clear the road so everyone can move on. And it actually only took about an hour and a half to find a bulldozer and get it up onto the site. And that's the two of us reveling in our moment to rest, but looking quite wet. Um, the original plan was to circumnavigate China in 60 days. And I'm very proud to say that we actually did it in 65 days, which is pretty close to our target. Um, no one has ever done a trip like this before, so there was no point of reference. I couldn't call anyone up and say, hey, what did you do on this day when you went between these two cities? It was nothing like that. So in a lot of cases, it was a very adventurous trip. We felt like we were breaking new ground. We felt like we were trying something that no one else had done. And we wanted to do it counterclockwise. Um, because that's kind of the better way that the weather would work out. We didn't want to go through the south in August because that would have been much hotter than going up through the north. Obstacles along the way, obviously extreme heat. The first kind of five, six days, seven days in eastern China, it was, it was 40 degrees Celsius or over 100 degrees Fahrenheit every day. Blistering sun when it wasn't raining and then it relieved us with rain. Uh, there was actually flooding along the Yalu River because it was raining so hard. And this is quite a scary thing. You're riding north along the border of China and North Korea towards, towards Russia and the Yalu River is flooding and it's coming over onto the road. And there was a lot of military in the region and they were actually evacuating farmers and getting them and you know there were, there were groups of 40 farmers in the back of a military truck going in the opposite direction and we were kind of just going right into the storm which, uh, which actually didn't hurt us but, but it could have I, I suppose. Uh, a lot of flooding in, nor in northeastern China. Uh, you can't do anything in China without running into the military in some way, shape, or form. And we had a very interesting encounter with the military in Inner Mongolia. China has a huge border between Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, and it's empty. There's really kind of no one out there. And, and there's one road that goes right along the border for about, for about three, four, five hundred miles. Um, and it's beautiful, and we really wanted to take that road. But of course, the road is full of military, so we were stopped kind of every 50 miles. It's like, how, what are you doing here? And then they held us for about an hour, looked at all our passports, didn't know why we had all this filming equipment. They had to call someone, figure it out, and then we would go another 50 miles, and then at another checkpoint, they would stop us again for an hour, because apparently the people at the last checkpoint didn't tell the people at the next checkpoint that there were a whole bunch of white guys coming through with motorcycles and camera equipment. And actually, there were about six checkpoints, so we, didn't, we only did about 200 miles in one day over you know, a 12-hour stretch, because we just kept getting stopped by the military. Uh, but to their, kind of, to their credit, they let us kind of continue on, because they felt like we weren't a threat, but they did feel we were quite silly in, uh, in, in what we were trying to do. Uh, in, in Xinjiang, we had sandstorms. I don't know if anyone's ever been in a sandstorm before, but it's horrible. Obviously, you lose a lot of your uh, ability to see. Um, and also, you get sand in every crevice of every piece of clothing and in every fold in your body, including your ears and your eyes and your nose. Um, and it is kind of suffocating. And we actually were riding one day and got caught in a sandstorm. And we had to hide out in a gas station until it passed. Um, Hailstorms. We had a lot of hail. You know, in September, on the border of China and Pakistan, it's usually good weather. I had actually been there several times. But uh, it was snowing the day we went up, and then we actually got caught in a full hailstorm. And of course, when you're in a nice car, you've got your heater, and you've got your DVD player, or your CD player, and your, or your MP3 player, and um, you're quite enclosed, and you're quite safe. But on a motorcycle, you really feel every you know, change in the environment. So in one day on the border of China and, North, and, China and Pakistan, we went from about 10,000 feet above sea level to about 17,000 feet above sea level. And the temperature, the temperature was, uh, I'm going to use Celsius because I just don't know. The temperature started about 10 degrees Celsius. 
And by the end of the day, when we got to the very, very top of the pass, it was about minus 15 degrees Celsius. Um, and we were completely soaked and frozen. And I actually almost got hypothermia. The G219 highway is the road that goes from western Xinjiang into western Tibet, one of the most remote, remote roads in the world. And it actually goes through a small piece of land that India and China had a war over in the 1960s. And it's heavily militarized, which was good fun. Um, we only had one real mechanical problem on the trip, and I burned out my clutch. And a clutch is the part of the motorcycle that changes gears and that recognizes the gears. And I actually burned that so badly that my motorcycle stopped registering gears. And this was in the middle of remote Tibet. And uh, we didn't have a spare part. So this was obviously quite an exciting part of our trip where we had to fly a clutch from Canada to Hong Kong, smuggle it across the border, and then fly it to Tibet, and then drive it to where we were, fix the clutch. And then we had to backtrack to where we stopped originally and then continue our journey so we didn't miss any of, our, uh, any of the miles that we had to do. Um, and of course, we even had rain coming back through, through uh, eastern China on the way. And this is us freezing on the border of China and Pakistan. And you can see anytime someone's standing there like this, that's an indication that they're quite cold. And we had these, uh, we had these balaclavas on you. You wear them when you go skiing to keep your face and neck warm. And we were wearing those under our motorcycle clothing. And those are actually two Pakistani military border guards. And they were up there as well in the very, very cold weather. And this was us just making a small repair. We had a battery problem one day. <clears throat> um, that was a picture I took of myself because I was surprised how I looked. You know, we were staying in a lot of really bad hotels. Uh, we were staying in a lot of guest houses. We stayed, we, t we had to camp out several nights uh, in Tibet especially. And I remember this was the first time we were in a hotel in about five or six days. And I just stood there in front of the mirror and, and I was amazed at how much weight I'd lost. And I lost about uh, 30 pounds on the trip in 65 days. And that was basically a combination of not eating, not eating uh, well. You know, we would have maybe some congee, which is like a rice soup and a hard-boiled egg for breakfast. And then we would try to have dinner. And dinner was kind of a mix of whatever noodles we could get, you know, plus maybe some bread. And we were lucky if there was any meat in there. And actually, we were riding so hard every day to kind of do the distance, because 18, 14,000 miles 13,000 miles is a really long way to go, that we kind of never stopped for lunch. And we would just have some granola bars or some chocolate bars along the way. Snickers was a good one because they've got peanuts in them. Gives you a little bit of protein. Um, but anyways, we'd all lost a lot of weight. So that was kind of what I looked like midway through the trip. This is Western Tibet. And it's hard to visualize how bad the roads are. It's really hard to visualize, you know, standing at the top of this high pass on a road and looking south as we are on this picture and trying to find where the road goes and trying to find out what the path is. And that's the road. You see that? And it's all switchbacks and it just goes back and back and back and back and then the other side and then it'll go down that valley and then it'll go back and back and back and back and over the top and go back and back. And you're doing that 12 hours a day, five, six days in a row. And there's no guardrail. There's no pavement. There's no gas station. We had to carry our own fuel in, in parts of Tibet. Um, it was kind of just us and some big trucks that were carrying kind of uh, supplies to some of the military bases in the region. So at that point, we were kind of thinking, well, what are we doing? Are, should we be here? Is this a place that uh, you know, is suitable for tourism? We did do some tourism. We went to Dunhuang. And in case anyone has been to Dunhuang or hasn't been to Dunhuang, it's probably one of China's most beautiful national park areas. They have these beautiful sand dunes there. And it looks like something out of the Sahara Desert. And uh, the best way to see the sand dunes is to, is to fly this glider up and over the sand dunes. And of course, we're making a television show. We want to show people how beautiful China is and how different it is. And so we flew the glider. And that's Chad on the left, and that's Colin in the middle, and that's me on the right. And we all took turns doing the glider and we did some filming up there. And it's, a, it's quite a nice part of our show. That's what it looks like from the glider. You know, and, and, and Colin, I remember when Colin went up and he did this glider, you know, they take you up for 15 minutes, which is plenty long because the thing's shaking. It's not a safe feeling. Uh, you know, you're up there for 15 minutes, you lose your lunch, you come back down, and you're thinking to yourself, 
who knows China looks like that? You know, so many people don't know that China really has parts of it that look that beautiful and that kind of remote and that untouched. And Colin said to the camera afterwards when he came down, Chad ran up and was filming him, and he's like, I had no idea that that existed in China. And that is really the kind of element that we wanted to show people with our book and with our television show, is that China will surprise you. And, you know, to do a trip like this over land, you know, we got a chance to really explore every inch of the country without skipping or missing a beat. So, was the MK ride a success? <laughs> We're alive, so that, in that sense, yes. Uh, neither of us got divorced, which is excellent as well, because um, our wives were still angry when we came home. But, but uh, we became the first people to circumnavigate China, and we were quite excited about that. Uh, and now we've had a lot of people who have come to us and wanted to do similar trips and wanted to do driving trips and wanted to kind of learn more about the experiences that we had on our journey. And uh, we set the Guinness World Record, which is actually, it's important to tell you, we didn't set out to set a Guinness World Record. We actually um, did our trip, and then someone from Guinness contacted us and said, do you have all the waypoints and all your hotel bills and all your GPS points and all that? Because I think you set a record, because no one's done this before. And the last person who did it was like around India. And of course, India is much smaller than China. So we actually set um, a Guinness World Record, and we had this big double page spread in the, in the 2012 book. 2011 book. Uh, and of course, we made our book, uh, we made a DVD, and we have a television show that's kind of being aired globally. And this has been such a kind of unique experience that uh, it led to another television show that we did recently in India. And we did the exact same concept. We wanted to show people what it's like in India. We rode a motorcycle all the way around India, and we just finished that uh, last year in October and everything will come out, the television show and the book and stuff will come out in November. So now it's kind of led to a bit of a new career for myself, uh, making adventure television um, and writing books about it and hopefully inspiring people to go off and explore the more remote parts of the world. So that's what two eggheads look like in the middle of Xinjiang, wearing our balaclavas. I, I'm serious, the weather changed four times a day. You know, in the morning it would be hot, in the afternoon it would be freezing and then at night it would be super freezing and we were every time we stopped we, we usually stop about once every hour once every hour and a half it's really hard to sit on a motorcycle for more than that kind of time without stopping and shaking out your legs and having some water but every time we stopped we were either putting on more layers or taking off more layers and it just became uh, exhausting in the end um, the MK ride uh, was a, a unique adventure because we actually had corporate partners for, for what we did. You know, Colin and I, we didn't use all of our own money because we were making a television show because we had these kinds of um, books and things like that. We did have corporate sponsors. And one of the, well, these three Uyghur men, they were not our corporate sponsors. They were, um, they were three lovely gentlemen in Kashgar who uh, helped us, you know, do some uh, motorcycle repair and change our tires when we were in Kashgar. And we had the most beautiful time in Kashgar. Um, but we did have some other partners. So Mandarin House is a Chinese language school in Shanghai, Beijing, and now London, England. And they were actually our biggest sponsors, and they helped us financially. Because we were doing something quite fun, quite amazing. Uh, and it's quite expensive to do a trip like this all the way around China. So it wasn't easy. And then we worked with a company called Touratech, uh, another company called Thompson Group, and then Oakley, the sunglass company, you all know probably. Uh, Airhawk, Low, Low Pro, and, uh, and Pelican as well. So you know, the, the amount of money that you require to do a trip like this and to make a television show kind of is beyond the average person. So it's really important that we had partners that helped us kind of in our vision. And I'll tell you that, you know, before I did this trip, I kind of thought that I could just call up National Geographic and say, I'm going to do something really stupid. Why don't you guys give me some money and I'll bring a camera? But it doesn't work like that. You know, the broadcasters don't really pay people to do much. You have to kind of go out and do it and then they'll air it. And I didn't know that when I first got into this business. So it was really important that we had these people helping us out. So this was probably my favorite day of the trip. Um, Inner Mongolia is beautiful. You know, we have all, we've all read the history books about Genghis Khan, about he kind of had his base in northern China or southern Mongolia, and he went off and conquered pretty much the entire Eurasian continent on horseback. And, you know, this is his land. And it was beautiful. It was a single lane road. You can see it's just pretty much wide enough for one car. And we didn't see any other cars on this road all day. And it was stunning, just rolling green grasslands in every direction. 
And again, a lot of people don't know that this kind of landscape, that this kind of you know, visual perfection exists in China. China also has some of the largest wind farms in the world. Not a lot of people know that, but actually they do. The government is subsidizing this investment and they're doing so in a massive way. And one night we actually camped in Inner Mongolia underneath the wind farms. And actually they're incredibly loud. Uh, when they're spinning, they'll keep you up all night. And if they rotate, they make this horrible creaking sound. Camels, there's lots of them, it's mostly in Xinjiang and Gansu and parts of Qinghai and parts of Tibet uh, in the deserts. And we saw lots and lots of camels at every turn. And that's kind of what we looked like when we were riding our bikes every day. Sunglasses were very important. And you can see we have a small camera up here and a small camera here. Um, and then we had our little boxes where we kept some extra clothes and some snacks along the way. Uh, that's the two of us, just enjoying a bit of rest. China, has, uh, China had the most dangerous uh, roads in the world up until about two years ago when India recently took over the crown as being the most deadly roads in the world, which is where I've just come back from doing the second trip. Uh, but we ran into this almost every day. We would see an accident in China almost every day, or the remnants of an accident. So every day we were going along, we would see a car in a ditch, or we would see a car being pulled out of a ditch. And it's kind of scary, because that's the same road that you're on. And you've got a wife and kids, and you're thinking, was this such a good idea when we came up to this idea in Central Park, you know, six months ago? That's a little bit tough to see in the light, but that's actually the Turpan Oasis. Turpan Oasis is this beautiful lake bed in Xinjiang province near the city of Turpan. And it's the second lowest point in the world. And it's the lowest point in China. And we actually camped out there one night. And that huge monstrosity over here on the other side uh, indicates exactly what that, that is. It's the lowest point in all of China. And it's this beautiful desert-like lake bed. Very beautiful. Uh, that's another shot of it. So that's kind of where we slept some nights. And, um, to give you an example of the remoteness. And a lot of people ask me, you know, what was your favorite part of the trip? And it was stuff like this. You know, we all know Eastern China is busy. We all know it's crowded. We all know it's congested. I live in Shanghai, a city of 25 million screaming people all trying to get rich at the same time. We know this of China, but this is where you sleep the best. This is where you wake up in the morning and you take it all in and you think, wow, I'm lucky to be out here doing this. That's a shot of Colin um, in Gansu province. Uh, and the road had just, there was a lot of cases where we would be riding on tarmac, we'd be riding on pavement all day, and then the pavement would just stop. And then we'd have to stop the motorcycles and then adjust the tire pressure, because you have to make a small adjustment when you go from riding on pavement to going to riding on off-road. And we would always stop, and you know, that's what the road looks like. That's, you know, you're just riding off into the badlands. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but it's like something out of Mad Max. <coughs> um, this was one of the more interesting things. It's a plane with no wings on the back of a truck. And, you know, we'd stopped for water, and we were just sitting there on the side of the road in the middle of this kind of desert, high plateau, a little bit of grass, and this plane just kind of was on the back of a truck driving through the desert. So I just turned around and grabbed a quick snap. Definitely one of the stranger things we'd seen. Not quite sure how it got there, and not sure what happened to its wings. For those of you who thought our trip might be glamorous, this is lunch. So you can see we've got some bottled water and we have some Oreo cookies. And what really pissed me off the most is I really like Oreo cookies with vanilla inside. And you couldn't find them in a lot of places. They had strawberry inside and it's horrible. <coughs> and because they're in your pannier bags, because the, the Oreo cookies and the water are in your pannier bags together and they're bouncing all over the place, by the time you actually want to eat an Oreo, you're just kind of eating the powder because they get crushed. So you can't even have a proper cookie. Um, but you know that kind of kept us alive for 60 days, which is why we lost so much weight. An interesting thing about China is <clears throat> they don't allow motorcycles to fill up at the gas pump. And it's because that the engine is exposed. So they think that if you are pouring gas and it overflows and then it hits the engine, that it'll burst into flames and everyone will die. And uh, there's no changing anyone's mind about this at any of the gas stations. They really love, the gas station attendants love their authority and they will hold on to it for dear life. So what happened was they made us 
fill up our gas tanks with a teapot. <laughs> so you can imagine, we're doing about 200, 300 miles a day. We're filling up for gas at least two times a day. And our gas tanks are huge BMW gas tanks. They take, they take a lot of gas. And each, each, uh, each motorcycle held about three of those teapots. And they didn't have two or three teapots. You couldn't fill up two or three and then take them over. It was one. Fill it up, empty it, walk back. Fill it up, walk back. Every time we stopped for gas, it was an hour. An hour. Imagine pulling up to a gas station in California and sitting there for an hour. It's enough to make you insane. You know, you want to get somewhere before dark, you're hungry, you're eating crushed Oreos, you're losing your mind, and this lady is telling you, and mostly women, this lady is telling you that you can't fill up at the pump. It could be five minutes, it could be three minutes, but no, it's an hour to do two motorcycles. And, you know, it was just, it destroyed you emotionally. It just brought you so low every day to have to go into a gas station. And gas stations should be fun places where you can rest, but no, it wasn't. So that's, uh, that, we played that up quite a bit in the, uh, in the television show because it was just insane. Again, China's diversity, incredible. From my home in Shanghai, which is, you know, as modern as any city in North America or Europe, to this. This is the Idka Mosque in central Kashgar. And Xinjiang is a place I've been, I've been traveling to for many years. I'm going to come out with a book hopefully later this year all about my about seven years of photography from Xinjiang. But it was a place that I love and a place I wanted to show in our television show. So we visited Kashgar, which is the, in the Muslim part of China where people practice Islam. And this mosque is one of the biggest and most important in all of Central Asia. And we were very lucky, mostly because I planned it like this. We were there for the end of the Ramadan festival. And the Ramadan festival is the period of time where the Muslim people who practice Islam do not eat during daylight hours. So they don't eat during daylight hours for one month. And then on one day, they all go to church, or sorry, they all go to pray at the mosque. And then after that, they all have a big feast. And they actually slaughter sheep, uh, and they eat lamb in the streets, and then they dance all day. And it's a great festival. And we happened to be in, in Xinjiang, in Kashgar, at the Idka Mosque on this day. And we were able to film a lot of it. And it was really a stunning day. And again, you can imagine, I've seen this before. I've actually been to two of these festivals in the last 10 years. But you can imagine Colin, Toronto, born and raised, in the finance industry. You know, he's all about his new car and his rims. And then I'm pulling him out into the middle of effing nowhere to visit this mosque for this Ramadan festival. It was his first interaction with kind of the world of Islam. It was his first interaction with Muslim people praying at a mosque. And there were, you know, 20,000 people in that square. And he was just blown away, you know. And that is, that is what we wanted to bring to our television audience. <clears throat> that's the two of us. That's the picture from our book cover you'll see. This is on the G219 highway. And again, that was that 1,000 mile stretch that was above 16,000 feet that we didn't sleep on for four or five days. And that's what we look like. Uh, oh, that's what we look like, um, you know, after four days on the road in this really remote area after not sleeping with all the altitude sickness. You can see we had some fantastic hair um, from being in our helmets all day. The dust was unbelievable. Uh, the altitude made you quite ill and very lightheaded, uh, but yet we had to carry on. And this G219 highway was easily the hardest part of the trip. And we were so passionate about this road and, and what we had accomplished when we finished it that we actually changed the name of our television production company to G219 Productions because we were so excited that we survived uh, this part of the journey. Tibet's beautiful. We spent 20 days in Tibet and it was stunning. And this is just one example of a beautiful glacial lake near Lhasa. And you can see the road is quite good. The roads are quite good in parts of Tibet, especially around Lhasa. It's all new infrastructure, all new investment. And you can imagine what it would be like just being on, a, on an extra long road trip, traveling through these beautiful, beautiful parts of the world. And uh, that was a really kind of beautiful day. And Tibet's a lot greener than a lot of people think. And then you go to this. This is Guilin, Guilin Yangshuo, the Karst Mountains, the Li River one of the most famous tourism places in all of China. I believe the picture of the Li River with these karst mountains is on the 20 RMB bill or the 5 RMB bill. I'm not 100% sure. I don't have any with me at the moment. But 
Again, this is what it would look like when we came back into China proper. So, a little bit about what's next. I wanted to kind of introduce this to you. Um, the Middle Kingdom Ride television series will have its global premiere on the Travel Channel uh, in April. Uh, the Middle Kingdom Ride book and DVD are available. And we just recently finished the India Ride, which was our equally stupid follow-up to the equally stupid motorcycle ride around China, where we thought we could circumnavigate India in 60 days. And we actually did it. And I can tell you, it was much, much harder than China, because India is crazy. Uh, the infrastructure is worse. There are more people. It is much hotter and a much more intense environment. The people are everywhere. Um, and I've been doing a lot of uh, speaking engagements, and USC is uh, just one of many that I'll be doing in the next few months. And we have a lot of new productions available uh, coming on tap later this year and early next year. So you're going to see a lot more, especially from China, uh, of me kind of going out and exploring China as a creator of the show, as a producer, and also as a presenter. And the next one that we're going to do in China is actually about me traveling around China as a photographer and going to the very kind of remote areas of China and understanding the minority peoples that live there uh, and integrating myself with that lifestyle. So I'm really looking forward to that, that we start filming that in October. So you can learn all about this on the mkride.com. That's our website.